Good morning, everybody. Great to see you here today at church. Welcome to Bendigo Baptist Church. Whether you're joining us in the room or you're joining us online today, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Would you like to stand? We're going to start our service with worship. <clears throat> and I hope you've had a good week. A lot can happen in a week, can't it? A lot can happen across the course of a week. And I know for me, it's been ups and downs, good times and bad times. Um, part of that is we live in a spiritual world. And the Bible talks about us living in a spiritual world and actually even talks about us uh, having spiritual forces that come against us. And sometimes that's uh, something we're really, really um, aware of and sometimes it's not. But the Bible talks about us having an enemy who wants to steal, kill and destroy. They're not my words. That's what the Bible says. One of the ways that we can combat that is by worshipping and praising God, by declaring truth. And as we come together as a church, that's part of why we do it. We come to declare truth. We come to praise and worship and lift up Jesus together. So as we sing, especially these first couple of songs today, we're going to declare that God is on our side, that he is strong. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. The battle belongs to the Lord. So why don't we come this morning with our hearts focused on Jesus, our hearts focused on his victory and his power, and let's worship him from a place of passion today. Let's sing together.
right? Thank you, Mike. The battle belongs to God. Whatever we're facing, He's with us. He loves us. He's powerful and He's good. We would love to introduce a new song to you today. A song about praising God and lifting Him up and acknowledging how worthy He is. So uh, as you pick it up, uh, please sing along with us. Like where they're in glory, 
today that you are the one, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. God, we want to show you that you're worthy of worship today. God, as we lift up our song and as we lift up our hearts, God, don't help us not to do it in a religious way, in a, in a way that is half-hearted, God. Help us to bring you all of ourselves, Lord, to give you our passion, Lord. There's nothing more th- more worthy of living for God than you, the one who has saved our souls and has redeemed us. And so we bring you, God, our highest worship today. We want to honour you with our praise, Lord. Let's sing together. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Oh, 
Sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Sing your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all power and position. Let's pray. Our Father, as we raise our voices to you this morning, Lord, in uh, honour to bring glory to your name, we acknowledge that you are holy today. You are holy yesterday. You will be holy tomorrow. For eternity, Father, you are holy. You are gracious. You are loving. You are kind. You are forgiving. You are our sovereign Lord. And we acknowledge that today as we lift our voices to you and 
sing these words, Lord. We honour you. We want to tell you we love you. And uh, we pray, Father, as we come together, that our voice will be pleasing to you, that you will hear our hearts and know that we acknowledge you as King. We acknowledge you, Father, our amazing Heavenly Father, that gave your Son, gave everything for us because of love. Lord, we thank you. We pray through Jesus' name to you that you hear our voice, you hear our hearts, and you will allow our hearts to be opened and transformed and be more like you every day. Thank you, Father, as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and good morning. Say hello to someone. There's lots more people wandered in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Say hello to someone next year. Grab a seat when you're ready. Good morning and welcome. It's good to see so many smiling faces there. My name is Matt Parkinson. I'm part of the ministry team here and I want to welcome you all this morning here. I want to welcome everyone online that's uh, listening from wherever you are. Uh, may you be blessed by our word and our worship together today. And um, as you join, I hope you feel connected to us as we um, join together in this room as well. Hey, um, It's been um, it's wonderful to be here and be able to share some um, things that are happening around the traps around the mad cow world as well. So um, I thought I'd firstly start, we've got a few slides up there. Um, the op shop move has begun to 315 Eagle Hawk Road um, in Kalgoorlie, which is awesome. And um, I was over at Eagle Hawk this morning just sharing a few things and um, proudly be able to say we now have a 3556 postcode. So that's pretty cool. And uh, they were very happy with that, but it is, um, uh, it was an amazing opportunity to come together. There was around 45 of us, I reckon, that um, managed to get out of the old warehouse and, and uh, keep working towards the new shop. Um, as if you're not sure uh, what's going on exactly, the new op shop is a big part of who we are in terms of um, providing resources for our homeless ministries. So it is an important part of um, our, our plan moving forward. It also has ministry within the op shop. And uh, so it was a wonderful time of fellowship together, food. Um, no one overdid it, I don't think. We all just, so many people doing wonderful things and it was a good day. And we, we cleaned the place out um, by the end of the day. It was wonderful. So thank you to all those that were able to um, give it their time. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. That whole place ended up completely clear. That's the new space there. Um, still a, um, a bit to do there. Um, and of course food always goes down well. Hot chips, my favourite. So that was great. It was a wonderful opportunity and um, thank you again for what we're doing. Also um, coming up in early July is the Mad Ride, Mad Ride number three, for the, if you uh, are not aware. And um, this time, this is the third stage, riding from Cunnamulla to Townsville. Um, when I say we, that does not include me, that is... Um, <laughs> But I will be the support crew this time for the first time I get to go along, which is exciting. And um, it is the third leg. We did it in 2017. Um, we did it again last year. And um, the guys, there's a, one gentleman from our church, Rick, over the Eagle Hawk campus, who's been training. And there's a lot of people you would know. 
But they said, do you still want us to do this at Mayor Cow? You want to continue to do it? And I said, well, we'd love you to be doing it for Mayor Cow. Raise a, a few funds, raise awareness of homelessness and uh, have an adventure as well. So uh, that heads off. There is a, um, I'm not sure if it's here, you can scan the QR code, but there is the Mad Ride, um, you can go to Mad Cow website, you can go to madride.madcow.org.au too, and that will uh, also give you some rider profiles, show you who's doing what, and you can track them. We leave on the 3rd, Monday the 3rd of July for eight days into Townsville. Sounds easy, doesn't it, by car um, from Cunnamulla, but on push bike, a little bit different. And um, again, just uh, raising awareness for our um, homeless here in the centre of town. The other thing to mention too is that we don't have a slide for today, is uh, that the Nexus um, production of Pirates of Penzance is coming up soon. That is the second two weeks of July, like the last two weeks of July. Tickets are on sale. I don't know if you saw those wonderful cutouts in, out the front there in the foyer. Check it out. Get online. Um, you can go via the Capital website if you like or the Nexus and follow and get tickets and support the youth theatre um, Pirates of Penzance. It's always a fun show, lots of, um, it's just a good feel show and wonderful opportunity and watching these kids shine is something special. So get on board and get your tickets and be part of um, Pirates of Penzance. They usually sell some little bits and pieces in the foyer, you can be part of the whole thing and I don't know what they're going to sell this year, John Swords or something like that maybe? Yeah, that'll be a bit of fun. Also, um, at the moment, our... Young adults are away on camp, which is awesome. We're going to pray for them in a minute too. But uh, they're away having an um, amazing time up snowboarding is what I hear they're doing. So that's uh, exciting too. Lots going on around the, the church. And I am constantly reminded that um, God's provision is amazing. And his provision of people, you know, what we achieve in the name of Bendigo Baptist Church for God is incredible. We have an incredible church of people that come together and do incredible things because God is using us in mighty ways and we are so grateful to God but I'm so grateful to all those that do your part. Whatever God's asking you to do is just just do it. Um, it's awesome and it's a wonderful, colourful expression of God in Bendigo. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, church, for what you do. Let me pray now and um, then I'll, and I'll pray for Steve who's going to bring a word today. Steve, would you like me to do the reading again this morning? I did put it on my phone just in case, but I'll bring it. Thanks, mate. <laughs> and um, then I will read from Luke 12, um, verse 13. I'll give you a chance to get that ready too. The peril of the rich fool. So um, let me pray first and then um, I'll read that, that scripture verse. Thank you. Uh, Lord, we do thank you um, we thank you we 're in awe of you when we just stop and look at your might and your wonder and your expression of oh, Lord, we just thank you we we lift our hearts up to you and ask that you continue to transform us through your word, through your spirit lord we we pray for those young adults away this weekend that uh, they will have an awesome time but um they will um draw closer to you lord as we do different crazy things around this place um and it brings us together we know that it is you that binds us together and uh, we pray that you continue to do that in every part uh, of across this city of this church that you bring us together and lord bring the churches of this city together in the one thing that does bring us together and that is the name of Jesus. Thank you Father for that and we do love you and um, we want to hear from you this morning. We pray for Steve as he brings the word this morning and Lord also um, we pray for the offering Lord as we receive so much from you we want to give to you we want to give to you first. We want to give to you to say we love you, we thank you, we hand over what is yours back to you. But we do it out of an expression of love for you, Father. As we uh, give to you, may it be used to your glory. We thank you, Father, for this time together now. For those of us that are um, not in this room, for those that may be in a state overseas, around Benigo, Lord, we lift them up to you, give thanks for who they are. May they share in this time together with us uh, in a way that is meaningful for them too. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Um, also, time for the um, the kids' bids, uh, kids, kids, bids, kids to go if they'd like to leave now. Anyone that's heading out that way, and. Um, Yes, and I didn't mention the offering. There is three ways to, um, for your offering. You can do it direct online. You can do the text to give. And there's always a black box on the back wall of the um, uh, auditorium where you can just pop money or an envelope, whatever you like, in there as well. Um, and um, we just ask that you do it out of, a, uh, out of love for Lord. Let me bring the reading to you this morning. So it is Luke 12, verses 13 to 34. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. For life is more than food and body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If If this is how God clothes the grasses of the field, which is here today, the tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all things, and your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not, never fail. Where no, thief comes, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Got there. Thank you. Amen to that. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Matt. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, this morning. Thanks, Matt, for reading that uh, for us. Uh, my name's Steve. If you haven't met me, um, it's a real uh, privilege to be here, to be able to open up um, God's Word uh, on this series, which you can really clearly see is called Money Matters, right? Um, it's pretty hard to miss. Um, and I, I don't know how you feel as you come in and you see a slide like that, or if you've been coming the last couple of weeks, uh, three weeks in, three weeks on money. Oh, do you feel about that? Oh man, the guy up the front, they got a new guy in this time. Um, <laughs> how do you feel when you just think, oh, the sermon's going to be on money again? I know, I know if some of us, um, money's really t- tight, actually. Um, interest rates are going up. I know my mortgage just keeps, <laughs> repayments just keep trickling up. Cost of living's going up. Um, school fees, they never seem to come down. For some of us, money might be really tight. And um, you see a slide like that and you think, oh gosh. I don't know, for others, um, you, might, money, you might be in a really good place. I don't know, maybe you've got a fair bit of spare cash and you're not really all that concerned about a slide like that. I'm not sure. 
uh, how you feel as you come and you, you see that the sermon's going to be on money. We all kind of react a bit, don't we, when we hear that the sermon's going to be on money. You know that little kind of thing in your heart where you just go, oh, what? maybe it's just me. <laughs> but we, we do that, right, because we figure that the person up the front is going to say that we have to give more money. I, I take it that's generally where that thought comes from. Well, let me assure you today, I'm not just going to tell you that we need to give more money. <laughs> now, today, what I want us to do is I actually want us to try and get behind the scenes on money. I want us to think about what's actually going on in our hearts when we see a slide like that, when we have feelings like we just talked about, I want us to see particularly today how the good news of the gospel of Jesus actually starts to reshape our hearts, change our hearts, free our hearts, so that money just doesn't cling so tightly anymore. I take it to do that, we're going to need God's help. I need God's help, we need God's help, so how about I pray for us, let's pray. Father God, we, we come to you and we ask of you because we, I, we are broken, sinful people who need your help. But you are an amazing God and Jesus is an amazing saviour. You give us your word and you give us your spirit to speak to us, to challenge us, to help us. So, Father, please, today, as we read your word, as we hear your word, would you, by your spirit, change our hearts so that we become more like Jesus? And we pray this in his name. Amen. I've been thinking about Bible, uh, not Bible, I've been thinking with my Bible open this week about money. And it seems to me that as we come to the New Testament in particular, and we've picked this up over the last couple of weeks as Dave's been opening up some of the different parables, it seems to me that the New Testament writers, when they speak about money, are actually kind of really clear about two things or two ways that we ought to be thinking about money. On the one hand, they they want to warn us about the hazards of money. But on the other hand, they want to encourage us about the helpfulness of money. So you see there on the screen, there'll be some slides coming up. I hope they'll be helpful. Um, I think the New Testament presents uh, this really clearly, that money can either be really hazardous in that we can get so caught up in it, we can just chase after it, that it can actually lead us away from God and eternity. It can actually become our God. Money can be really hazardous, and so the New Testament writers want want to warn us of the hazard of money. But also, money can be really helpful. And we know that, right? Money can be really helpful. We can pay for our daily needs, our food. We can can help people find out about Jesus with our money. Money can be either really hazardous or really helpful. And it seems to me that Jesus, uh, particularly today, wants to warn us about the hazard of money, as he tells us the parable of the rich fool, but also encourage us in the helpfulness of money as we consider how we can actually start to give some of it away. It seems to me as we open up this passage uh, in Luke 12, which uh, Matt read for us, um, there's a really big warning at the start. But before we get there, I want us to think a little bit about money. Um, and, and that is, the first thing to say is that money actually represents value. Money represents value. So you think about this, money itself is really just pieces of plastic and metal, isn't it? I was wondering, um, has anyone got cash these days? <laughs> Non-rhetorical question. Matt, have you got any cash on you? None. Is it because you don't want to give it away? Is there something going on in your heart? Yeah. <laughs> I, I bought a bit of cash because I knew Matt wouldn't have any. He's probably given it all away. Um, this, this is just a piece of plastic, really, don't you think? But it's a special piece of plastic. Why is this piece of plastic any different to other pieces of plastic? Well, it's actually because, you know, should I sit it here? Oh, that'd be too tempting. If I leave it there? No. That, 
You just wanted to see if it was yours? Yeah, it, <laughs> it, looks, it looks the same. Yeah. Why is it that this piece of plastic is different to any other piece of plastic that we might just chuck in the bin? Well, in, for one thought, is that this piece of plastic, our, our nation, I guess, has deemed that this particular piece of plastic is worth something. It's valuable. It's worth 50. Right? And so we can take this 50 and we can exchange it for things that we value. Right? So I could take it and I could exchange it for things. I, I value taste. I value health. Probably taste more than health sometimes. And so I take my piece of plastic and I exchange it for the things that I value, for food. I take other pieces of plastic and I exchange them for other things that I value. Are uh, things that I value, like my kids getting a good education, like having a, a house over my head, like entertainment, go to the movies. We, we actually, where our money goes actually shows what we value in our hearts. Money represents value. We value people coming to know and love Jesus, don't we? So we give to the church. We give to missionaries. Jesus says, Luke 12, uh, verse 34, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The movement of our money actually signifies the movement of our heart. Where our money goes, that's where our heart's going. We exchange money for what we value, what we treasure. See, the, the piece of plastic itself, it's really nothing, right? But it's expression, where it goes... That's everything, because it reveals what we really treasure. And so I think about my spending, and I think particularly um, we ought to be thinking about, I guess, kind of that discretionary spending. You know, I guess a lot of us, I think, are just kind of locked in uh, to a whole lot of our money, just keeps going out. We've got to pay the mortgage off, got to pay school fees, got to do this, got to do that. A lot of it's already locked in. But I think the challenge for me as I think about money myself is, what about that kind of extra money that's a bit unaccounted for, if you've got any of that, where does that go? Is that just going for me, for my pleasures? Or am I actually considering how I could give and be generous with that? Where our money goes is actually a really good indication of what we treasure in our hearts. If you've got your Bible open, uh, have a look at uh, Luke 12 uh, and verse 13. Because here we meet Jesus again speaking to people as they consider this topic of money. Uh, there's a man in the crowd and he calls out to Jesus. He asks a question about money. You see it there? He says, teacher, verse 13, tell my brother to, inv to divide the inheritance with me. See so this man, he, he comes to Jesus because he's got a problem. Most likely he's... Last remaining parent has died. There's been a, a split up of the inheritance. Uh, it seems that maybe his brother got it all or more than he should have. And this guy feels like he's being ripped off. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, come and sort this out for me. Sort out this problem. Effectively, tell my brother <laughs> to give me the cash. And look what Jesus says. As you keep reading, do you notice Jesus completely avoids the details of the family dispute? He doesn't go, okay, well, tell me how much was there? How much did your brother get? How much did your sister get? How much did you get? He doesn't do that, right? He doesn't go into any of the details. No, what he does is he actually hones in on this guy's heart. He wants to tackle the heart problem. See, Jesus can see that this man is caught up in greed and discontentment. He can see that it's ruining the relationships around him. And Jesus wants to tackle that. Jesus wants to solve his heart problem, not just give some sort of surface level money dispute answer. Look at what he says in verse 15. Verse 15, he gives a warning about how hazardous money can be. Verse 15, he says, watch out. It's like as though a snake's coming up behind him. Or <laughs> watch out. It's a, it's a warning, right? Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. 
Watch out. Big warning, Jesus says, for greed. Now, I don't know about you, but I know when I kind of hear that, when I read that, in my heart, I kind of think, oh, I think I'm okay. I don't think I'm all that greedy. It's kind of easy sometimes, isn't it, to kind of look out and think, oh, those people, they're definitely greedy. I don't have that much. I can't be that greedy, right? I don't really think greed is a problem for me. Let me tell you why I think this is so important. I actually think greed affects all of us, regardless of how much we have or how little we have. Greed actually affects all of us. It's deep in our hearts. But secondly, and I say this to uni students, more often what happens when it comes to money is that the kind of the habits, the way we think about money, the way we, we give or take or keep money, those kind of habits, um, the habits we develop when we have little actually remain often the habits that we have when we have more. I don't know if you've noticed that in your own life. A lot of us think, well, you know, when I get more, when I get a job, when I get this, when I get that, when I get that pay rise, whatever it is, then I'll be more generous. But it actually doesn't work that way because greed affects us. Greed is in our hearts. Just because we have more never actually means we want to hang on to it any less. In fact, often we have more and we think, well, I can do more with it. And so it's even harder to give away. The habits we have when we have little. When I was at uni, I remember an older Christian man said to me, he said, Steve, um, if you can't give from little... What, thinks, what makes you think you're going to be able to give when you've got lots? And I think he was right. Because greed affects us. And Jesus says here, watch out for greed, right? And I take it he says that because that, that phrase, watch out, is really significant um, because none of us actually believe or see that greed is there. Jesus says, watch out to warn us of things that kind of sneak up on us, that we're kind of unaware of. See, so just come, think about the man that Jesus is talking to, the man with the, the dispute about the inheritance. I imagine, you know, put, I imagine this man feels really ripped off, right? I imagine that he feels that, you know, he didn't get his fair share of the inheritance and so he feels cheated, he feels hard done by But I take it that he also feels in his heart that if he could just get that big chunk of money, then everything would be okay, wouldn't it? Like, if if he could just get that inheritance, then then he could do that, and he could do that, and he could pay that off, and and he could do that, and then he'd be satisfied, right? He thinks if he can just get that money, then it will solve his problem. See, money has snuck up on him and it said, if you want that real life, if you want that satisfying life, then you need me. That's what money does, right? It says, I can give you what you want. I can solve your worries. That's what money does. It says, I can solve your problems. How about you? But I, I know for me, like if I'm being honest, sometimes I walk past the news agent. And I see those signs, you know, it says jackpot, $2 million scratchy. And in my heart, I think, I want to buy a scratchy. Because if I got that, or, you know, you're watching the footy, right? You're watching the footy on TV, sports bed ad comes on. You know, sports bed ads all the time. And they've got a little disclaimer at the end. It says, you know, you lose some, you win more. But we never believe that, right? We always think we're going to win more. We know the Bombers are probably going to lose on the weekend, so why not put some money on it, cash in? Go past the news agent. What's going on in our hearts? I think if I just got that bit of money, if I won that jackpot, that million dollars, I'd be able to pay off the mortgage, do the school fees, buy this, buy that, set myself up, I'd be okay, right? Because that's what money does, right? It comes and it whispers to us and it says to us, if you have me, you will have life, you will have contentment, you will be happy. And Jesus says, watch out. Watch out. 
And to do that, he tells a really disturbing story about a farmer. It's there in verse 16. Uh, Matt read it for us. Verse 16 says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, Well, what shall I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I just want to pause there and notice two things just from those couple of verses. Firstly, do you see this guy's wealth has increased? That's generally what we think would be a good thing. But do you also see the increase in this guy's wealth has not made his life any easier? It's actually complicated his life, hasn't it? He's now like, well, what am I going to do with all this grain, with all this wealth? He's now got an extra problem. But secondly, probably more so, um, do you see there in verse 16, do we actually see what Jesus says? Very important little detail, I think. Where the abundance comes from. Do you see it there in verse 16? He says it's from the ground. Did you notice that? The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Jesus doesn't say that this guy was a farming genius. He doesn't say that he got the crops in and no one else did. Uh, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't put it down to his exceptional farming skills, even though he obviously would have gone out and planted the crop. Now, in this story, who's given the credit? God, isn't he? Because God is the one who's made the ground rich. God is the one who sends the rain on the crop. God is the one who we're ultimately to be thankful for whenever there's an abundance. And I take it that farmers actually know this more than anyone, that wealth is never self-made. But it's not just farming, is it? I don't know where you make your money, uh, what business or trade it might be in. But it's worth asking the question, is it, well, who is it that gave us our brain so that we can think so well and contribute and therefore be paid for that if we're a teacher or something like that? Or if we're in the trades, who is it that gave us our body, our hands, our skills so that we can build and make things and, and, and get paid for it? These are all gifts from God, our creator, aren't they? God is the one who has equipped us, who has given us everything that we can use, life and breath and health and everything else. Our brains, our skills, our wealth, it's all a gift from God. And so the question is, what will we do with what God has given us? We will be good stewards of what God has given us. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. Or will we be like the man in this story? And think that we own what actually God owns. Keep reading the story with me. Verse 18 and 19. Look at what the man says. Then he said, verse 18, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Eat, drink, or oh, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. What do you notice about this man and his words? Did you notice anything? Did you notice the repetition of the words I and my? This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and I will store my surplus and I'll say to myself, do you hear it? It's all I, me, my, I. It's all about him, right? This man, you hear those words and you see that his passion, his treasure, what is it? It's himself. It's himself, isn't it? His primary error, I take it. The essence of his greed was to take the abundance that God has given him and use it all for himself. All of it. Rather than return God's generosity to those in need around him. You know, this man, I take it, is fundamentally an Australian. There you go. He thinks the purpose of life is to get more stuff and be happy. Eat, drink, and be merry. It's our anthem, isn't it? Go to Bunnings. Buy more stuff. Go shopping. Get more stuff. Set ourselves up. 
I don't know if you've ever read um, the social commentator Hugh Mackay, Australian social commentator, great guy to read. He said that over the past 50 years, Australians have walked out of churches on a Sunday morning and into Westfield shopping malls. Shopping is our new religion, is what he says. Not a Christian guy, right? He's observed that. And I think it's not just Sundays, is it? It's every day of the week. We all do it. It's, it's our new religion. It's what we worship. And Jesus says to that kind of person, to the, to the man in this story, fool. Fool. He says, your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Why? Well, because whoever has the most toys in the end still dies and has to give an account for how they've lived. This man is a fool. Do you see? Do you know why he's a fool? He's a fool. Well, he's actually he's not a fool for some reason. He's not a fool because he was successful. There's no mention of that. It's it's fine that he's successful. He he's not a fool because he was rich. He's never condemned for that. He's not a fool because he had savings. It's fine. It's probably wise, good to have savings. He's not even a fool because he was able to use his wealth to enjoy life. No, he's a fool because the way he used his wealth showed what he really valued, himself and not God. The way he used his wealth demonstrated that he had no love No care at all for God. None. None for the God who had given him so much. Didn't acknowledge God. He never says thanks to God. No, he just went about his life completely ignoring his creator. And Jesus says, if you do that, if you live your life like that, fool. Only a fool, Jesus says, would get so caught up in this life that they would lose God and lose the next. So I take it the key verse in this whole parable is verse 21, right? You see verse 21? Jesus says, This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. The encouragement is to be rich towards God. So how do we do this, friends? That's my question. How do we do this? How do we guard ourselves from greed, from materialism? Because it's all around us, isn't it? You, you flick on the TV, the advertising, it constantly bombards us. It says, you need this, you need this. If you get this, buy this, then you'll be happy, then you'll be okay. How do we guard ourselves against that? Well, Jesus goes on in verses 22 to 34. And I take it that the way he says that we do that, the way to guard ourselves against greed and discontentment is actually to find our contentment in him. And what he gives us. So have a look there at verse 22. Verse 22, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will, or about your body, what you will wear. It's a pretty hard command. Right? But Jesus, do you see, he makes a switch there. He, he goes from talking about greed and he switches to start talking about money. Do you see that? And that is because there's actually a really close um, connection between worry and greed. Worrying is actually the cause of greed. See, why is it that I want to go out and get more and more stuff? It's actually generally because I'm worried about something, isn't it? Why do I want to put more money in my superannuation? Well, it's because I'm worried that no one will be there to look after me when I need it. Why do I go and buy certain types of clothes to look more attractive? Well, it's because I'm worried about what people will think of me if I don't look that way. Why is it that that, that I, I worry about giving money away? I can't give that away, I can't give that away. Well, generally it's because I'm I'm worried that I won't have enough left for myself. So the real connection you see between greed and worry. And to unpack this idea to help us, Jesus actually tells two really beautiful stories. One about birds and one about flowers. 
And both of them, I think, actually draw out for us um, quite different ways that greed leads to worry. Some of the big things that we wrestle with in our hearts. Have a look at verse 24. Verse 24, Jesus tells a story about some birds. He says there, consider the ravens, verse 24. They have no storerooms or barns, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Do you see what Jesus is getting at here? This little picture. He's saying, don't worry about getting more and more stuff in order to feel secure. Look at the birds. God provides for them, doesn't he? Ravens don't kind of hoard and save and hoard and save and some sort of attempt to feel safe about the future. No, ravens trust God that he makes them secure. In verse 27, he says, look at the lilies, the the flowers. Look how beautiful they are. Not not even King Solomon was as beautiful as them. And this illustration, I think, is all about appearance, isn't it? It's all about how we worry about our image, about how we will look to other people. Will will people like me? Will they find me attractive? Will I be pretty enough? Will will my life be impressive enough? And so we go out and we buy stuff and and spend money on ourselves in order to look better. Whether it's our face, our clothes, our house, whatever it is. Because we worry about how we appear. And Jesus says, friends, little flock, don't worry like that. Don't worry about the security of your future. Don't worry about your appearance. Why? Well, verse 29, he says, don't set your heart on that. Don't worry like that. The pagan world chases after things like that. Your father knows you need that. Verse 31, he says, seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Do you see how kind Jesus is in his words there, how gentle and tender? Little flock, you don't need to be afraid of the future. Don't be afraid of your your appearance, of what people might think of you. Why? Because it pleases the Father to give you the kingdom. We don't need to worry about the future. We don't need to worry about our appearance when we're in God's kingdom. Do you know why? Because when you become in God's kingdom, when you put your trust in Jesus, you actually get both of those things to the ultimate degree. When you first put your trust in Jesus, do you know how secure you become? You're given a new life that lasts now and it goes all the way into eternity. Jesus says, you put your trust in me and you are saved and safe and secure for eternity. That's real security, isn't it? That's real future, isn't it? And God says, it's safe in me. That's better than the 80 or 90 years that we get to live now. You get eternity. But secondly, Jesus says, and when you put your trust in him, we actually get a whole new appearance, a whole new beauty, a whole new attractiveness. We actually get clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Do you know, on the cross, when we put our trust in Jesus, all the things that make us really ugly, our sin, get completely paid for and buried with him and we get his beauty all our sin all our ugliness all all our our lies our, our greed our discontentment whatever it is jesus says i pay for that it's gone i wash you clean now you have my beauty he clothes us in his righteousness two things right when you're in the kingdom we have true security a true future we have true beauty And they can never be taken away. And it's all a gift from Jesus. So Jesus says, friends, find your contentment in what I give you. 
true security, true beauty. Find it in what I give you as I die for you on the cross, as I give you new life, new beauty, new clothes. The answer to worry and greed, you see, is actually to find our contentment in him, to find our contentment in Jesus, in what he gives us in the gospel. And friends, I take it that when we do that, when we start to to slowly, bit by bit, become more content in what he has already given us, when we see that money can't buy what Jesus gives us, money can't buy us the type of security he gives us. Money can't buy the type of beauty that he gives us. When we start to see that, when we start to believe that, when we see that money isn't as good as Jesus, then money actually starts to lose its grip on us, doesn't it? We see that it's not everything anymore. He is. And it's only then, when money starts to lose its grip on us, that our hearts change. And we can start to be generous. We can actually be generous with our money when it doesn't mean everything to us anymore. When we see people in need, we'll be glad to be able to help them out. When we see people um, who are heading for an eternity without Jesus, we'll be moved to give to churches, to missionary organisations. I don't know where you're at today as you sit at the end of this series. Maybe you need to rethink your money, your spending, where it's going. But I think most importantly... What we all need to do is we actually need to let this good news of the gospel sink deep in our hearts, don't we? That in Jesus we have true security. In Jesus we have a future. In Jesus we have true beauty. We don't need money for those things. We've already got it. So we can give it away. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. Father God, we... Um, we are sorry for the way that we've so often been like the man in this passage. We've thought life is all about ourselves. We've treated what you've given us as things just to be used for ourselves and our pleasure. We're sorry, I'm sorry. Father, we thank you that because Jesus died and rose... We can be fully forgiven and given a fresh start every day. Father, thank you for your grace to us in Jesus. Thank you for the amazing things that we get in the gospel. We get new life that lasts into eternity. We get new clothes that are truly beautiful. Father, please help us to see these amazing truths. Help us to believe them. And may, as a result, we become more like Jesus. Be kind, generous, and loving like him. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Stand together and let's um, respond to God as we sing and worship him.
sing these words from our heart this morning. This is my desire. This is my desire. Yes, Jesus. To says at the end there, do not be afraid, little flock. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will never wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and no moth destroys. Where your treasure is, where your heart will also be. It's our prayer today that Jesus would be our treasure. As we sing this again, that's what we're praying for as we sing these words together. That he would be our treasure. That would live for him. Let's do that together this week. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. And not just words today, God. I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm away Have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart I give you my soul showed us such love and such mercy and such grace God we know that we can trust you with our hearts and with our lives and so God we hand them over to you today we bless you Lord we bless you Jesus you're so good you're so kind to us we thank you God God send us out today with your gospel on fire in our hearts Lord that we'll reach a world that's hungry and desperate for you Lord Help us, Lord, in every part of our lives, whether it's our finances, 
whatever it might be, God, to live for you. We bless you, Father, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, Steve, for sharing with us today. It was awesome to hear from you. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, We hope to see you again next week. You're welcome to head out to the foyer and grab a drink, grab something to eat. Uh, Have an awesome week. We'll see you later.